Welcome to the Alain Guillot Podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Professor Elizabeth Hill Hinton. Elizabeth is an Associate Professor of History and African American Studies at Yale University and Professor of Law at Yale Law School. Her research focuses on the persistence of poverty and racial inequalities in the 20th century United States. And today we will speak about her book, America on Fire, the untold history of police violence and black rebellion since the 1960s. Professor Hinton, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Uh, so I don't know, but I think this is a time in history in which your opinion will be in great demand. There is so many things going on, especially since last year, life, uh, Black Lives Matter. And well, uh, uh, a few months ago, a few weeks ago, we had the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre as well. So, I mean, this is an issue that continue coming over and over again, and it's not gonna be, go away until we find some kind of solution. <laughs> so um, um, we will get to that. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about you. How do you, yeah, tell us how do you get to be a professor in this subject and law professor and uh, a little bit about your early years as well. So I've always been really interested in, in questions of history and justice, especially growing up um, during the 80s and 90s as the war on drugs was ramping up in high gear as well as mass incarceration and understanding how those policies directly impacted my family. Um, and when I was in graduate school at Columbia University, I visited, I started visiting family who were incarcerated. And when I kind of stepped into the complex of a prison. Uh, the first prison I visited was High Desert State Prison in Susanville, California. I was just stunned at uh, and angered and uh, <laughs> yeah, just pissed off by what I saw. I mean, that, that's not even, I don't know how to even capture it, but um, you know, here you had generations of mostly men of color locked up interacting with their kids um, and in a far away place, far from where um, most of the people who are incarcerated there lived. And at this, you know, this was in the, um, the mid 2000s and at a time when people were not, mass incarceration was not a buzzword. People weren't really talking about these issues and I wanted to understand how we got here. So that led me to my first book called From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America, which came out in 2016 and is a history of federal crime control policies. And out of that book um, emerged the questions and the, the stories that are at the heart of America on Fire. Can you Tell us how difficult or easy it was for you to get into graduate school. I think, for, you know, I, I, I always really loved doing research and I knew I went to New York University for, um, for undergraduate and I was fortunate to have the opportunity to research with the great historian Robin D.G. Kelly as he worked on his biography of Thelonious Monk, the jazz musician. And my task uh, for Robin was uh, to, to research Monk's childhood in this neighborhood in New York City called San Juan Hill, which is uh, now uh, has been transformed into a public housing project called the Amsterdam Project, but the community itself was raised in the post-war period to make way for <laughs> Lincoln Center. And um, I wrote about, I ended up becoming fascinated with San Juan Hill and archival work in general. And, um, and so I think, you know, I mean, in some ways, I it, it was it seemed like a natural next step to um, to continue to have the opportunity to learn and to do research in graduate school. And I I, I was lucky because I um, I quickly found my calling and kind of fell in love with doing archival work. OK, so can we then um, now let's go into your book, America on Fire. 
can you give us a historical context of the 1960s and today the, with the Black Lives Matter movement? And also there is the uh, concept of critical race theory going on and, and, and voter suppression. There are so many things going on. <laughs> so just give us a context from, from the 60s to today, all the things that are happening. So I guess, you know, in, I mean, in the broadest sense, what connects the two periods and, and really all of U.S. history, you know, you mentioned Tulsa in the opening and, and, be, and you know, well before that, too, is just the endurance of, um, of racial inequality and political and economic uh, exclusion from uh, U.S. institutions for marginalized groups and, and groups of color uh, in particular. And so, you know, the story, I mean, certainly of, you know, I guess the latest chapter of that, of the uh, continued history of racial oppression and exploitation, which is, you know, I mean, a, <laughs> has, has structured the, you know, the United States historically and is at the heart of what critical race theory is trying to trace. Um, you know, the latest chapter is, occurs, of, of course, you know, in that really important transitional 60s moment and the post-civil rights period. Um, you know, the 1960s, and this is one of the, the, the big things that America on Fire wrestles with, um, you know, the 1960s guaranteed Black people the right to vote, to shop at, at certain stores. It created um, a Black middle class, but it didn't, and, and opened up uh, political representation for Black people. But for, for many, especially low-income Black people, the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act did not fundamentally transform conditions. It did not uh, fundamentally lead to <clears throat> substantial political and economic empowerment. And, um, and, you know, now, 50 years later, in some cities, um, in some places, the United States is more segregated than it was before the Civil Rights Movement. We have a, a humongous, I mean, stratification, you know, is, is a humongous problem, but the racial wealth gap in particular between Black and white Americans is acute. And so, um, you know, the, the, the forms of political violence that I trace in the book are, you know, very much about uh, a transition within the larger civil rights movement from nonviolent protest to self-defense and also fighting back and resisting the, uh, the, the kind of growing expansion uh, and militarization of police forces in U.S. cities. And, you know, ultimately the major structural transformation in the 1960s came, you know, not in the form of um, investing in low-income communities of color, in you know in in and meeting and hearing the demands um that that steered both the civil rights movement and the rebellions that i write about right you know that is um full employment expanded educational opportunities uh decent housing political and economic inclusion which is what you know what i've been talking about um, instead, the, the structural transformation comes in the form of the modernization of American law enforcement. And so that is the real legacy of the, of the 1960s, um, police and surveillance and, and incarceration, rather than job, job opportunity programs, job creation programs, and uh, robust urban public schools, and, um, and, and and housing and you know housing free from slum landlords and deterioration from low income people don't end up being the thoroughly implemented social program in the late 20th century it's um it's the it's the law enforcement apparatus and 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 that's the the kind of legacy that we're in with today that you know is in the backdrop of so of, of the protests that we saw last summer um but also you know, has has functioned this uh, mass incarceration and, and mass criminalization has functioned as the the kind of engine of racial inequality post civil rights. And so, you know, my work as a whole looks at these dynamics, but America on Fire in particular examines the ways that communities responded uh, to the to the programs of the war on crime in the late sixties and early seventies, and kind of the legacies of um, continued. Uh, discriminatory and or racist uh, policing and 
uh, and surveillance practices today and, and of course, state violence. Yes, so you make it a point that when politicians are facing this, all these inequalities and problems and justice uh, uh, problems going on, they decide to put the bulk of their money on more policing as opposed to on social problem, uh, programs that will help uh, alleviate the situation. And I have read in some statistics, I cannot remember where, that it costs a lot less money to put a person through college, a four-year college, than to put them in prison. Yet, politicians, for some reason, maybe because they look like they are tough on crimes or that they can provide a fast solution for tomorrow, they prefer to put all the money in law enforcement and prisons and all these instead of just helping the community and, and offering the services that are really needed. Exactly. I mean, that's the, and, and, and that, you know, what you just mentioned, that, that some states spend more money on incarcerating young people, especially than educating them. I mean, that, that pretty much captures the, the, the dynamics, but also the, the kind of failed policy approaches post-civil rights. I mean, that should not, that fact should not be a part of uh, democracy and and as a result of of the, the this the, the continued criminalization of low income people in general undereducated people people of color in the United States uh, you know we have become a, a divided country our democracy has has unraveled and and so many of the the uh, social divisions that we're seeing today have have these policies um, at our root and of course a lot of you know that the resistance to embracing solutions outside of police, um, because you know that's that's really again the the, the kind of the post civil rights trend. Police become a way to manage the material consequences of poverty and racial inequality as they appear through crime and violence. And this is of course very much rooted in long held race, racist assumptions about people of color. And, and poverty and crime and a consistent unwillingness to, you know, support the structural transformation necessary to disrupt the racial hierarchies that have defined the United States historically. Right. You made a point uh, to uh, remind us that uh, sometime in his past in history, the war riot was something that happened when white vigilantes went on and created disturbances and disturbances, mostly the destruction of black neighborhoods. Uh, and you make it a point to call what is going on today a rebellion instead of a, a riot. At the same time, I want to highlight that the uh, Tulsa massacre was originally called a riot to pull yes. blame on the black people of what was going on. In fact, they were the they were the ones who were blamed for all the burning and destruction that happened at that time. So, can you elaborate on the use of riot, rebellion, and massacre? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's such an important point. I mean, fr you know, from the antebellum period onward. Most of the violence, um, so, so for the most of American history, the mo the collective violence, the the mob violence that that we see is uh, is is white supremacist vigilante violence directed against uh, communities of color. You know, we see this. You know, especially as Black Americans begin to migrate from the southern states to the north and the west uh, during during World War One and World War Two. I mean. You know, Tulsa, the Red Summer of 1919, uh, saw uh, white mobs and and you know come into black communities and black communities arm themselves and and fight back in self defense. And then, of course, as you mentioned, Tulsa in 1921, um, and we see another kind of resurgence of this mob violence in in the um, in the World War II period. But it wasn't until the 1960s when you know collective violence emerged in American cities. Uh, by, you know, primarily Black people in response to uh, exclusionary and repressive institutions that policymakers began to label this political violence as a riot and dismiss it as criminal. I mean, of course, you know, one of the things that was so distinctive about 
the white supremacist violence in the earlier period and still today, as we saw uh, in the attack on the Capitol January 6th, is, is the, the deep complicit, complicity or complete entanglement between local law enforcement and the white supremacists, right? Um, and, and these, you know, the, the actions of the white mob were not labeled as criminal in the way that, that we, that, that the black collective violence of the 1960s, again, rooted in civil rights grievances was. And, and the problem with this terminology, you know, calling these incidents a riot, um, is that it prevents us from embracing or, or even seeing solutions beyond police because if, if a riot is criminal, then you know, the, the response is, is, is more police, which is of course the very thing that people are rebelling against. If we take a step back and say, what are the underlying socioeconomic conditions that are making people feel as though they have no recourse but to take to political violence and we being we actually address those conditions which is what the kerner commission or the national advisory commission on civil disorders suggested to the johnson administration and the american public in their famous report of 1968 right um you know the in the absence of that larger embrace of the the root causes police are the only solution and we're kind of we're, we're stuck in this cycle um, this policy cycle where police become the the only and enduring response, and we see that cycle continue to play out today. We certainly saw it uh, during the the protests last summer. Uh, okay, so the cycle continues, but is there going to be an end? Uh, now there is a new president. There are a lot of people have examined the Black Lives Ma uh, Matter movement. And there is this uh, defund the police uh, petition or idea, uh, or which really doesn't mean to eliminate the police, but also to take money from police informants to other services like mental health, or uh, I don't know what other. Uh, I'm not an expert on the field, but uh, my question is: Is their cycle going to continue, or is there going to be an end eventually to this? horrible cycle. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we have to hope that, uh, that it won't continue. I mean, that's one of the, you know, that's one of the things that I, that, you know, drove me to write this book is that I think history can be a really important tool in terms of helping to identify these patterns and the way out. And, you know, one of the things that's, that's been very clear, you know, I've spent now uh, 20 years uh, doing work in this air area, and we, you know, that we, we know now that police reform is not enough. We have to move beyond police reform if we actually want to solve these problems. And again, this is something that the Kerner Commission uh, pointed out in its 1968 report. So we need, and this is also what um, defund, you know, the spirit of defund is, is all about. It's about investing a different set of resources into communities that actually get at the root causes of, of problems. Police officers, because of the continued disinvestment from basic social services and social welfare programs, you know, in, in over the past 50 years, certainly after civil the civil rights movement, at the expense of um, or you know, amid the continued escalation of policing and incarceration, has not kept many of our most vulnerable communities safer. In the end, gun violence remains um, a problem in many communities and, and the relationship between residents and outsider police forces uh, is, is often very confrontational. So there, there, are, all, there are all sorts of um, approaches to public safety that don't necessarily involve the police and also investments that can be made to get at the root causes of, of crime and violence and, and social harm in our communities. And I think, you know, this is what defund is about. This, this is what many of the discussions about d domestic policy priorities are about. Um, and, you know, it's clear that that embracing punitive policies as a way to manage in racial inequality has failed. Um, it's failed consistently. For, for more than 50 years now, and it's time to try a new set of approaches. And I think that's what the, the mass mobilization, the protests of last summer were about. I mean, some have called this the, the largest social movement in US history. And I think especially younger generations wanna see a different mode of governance, wanna see elected officials address, um, you know, not 
in, in a stale way, uh, a, a crime problem, but address issues of cri climate change to actively work to create a more equitable society, to redirect resources into programs that will expand opportunities for people and respond to, to, to real crises like student debt, instead of you know spending taxpayer dollars on policing people for you know really uh, usually you know minor offenses. I mean. Dante Wright, who was recently killed shortly after the uh, conviction of Derek Chauvin was announced, was pulled over because he had an air freshener uh, hanging from his rearview mirror, mirror and an expired uh, insurance registration. Again, you know, this is not, and, and now that the case, the protest, all of it, it's going to cost like tens of millions of dollars and it could have been avoided. Um, so we, we really need to rethink priorities and the solution is not to continue to invest in more training and more equipment for police because that's always the solution uh, after these moments of, of political violence or crises and it hasn't worked. Um, okay, so you are an associate professor of history and African American studies and I, I, my question, my next question is about critical race theory, which I see as a whitewash of history or, or erasing history completely from, from the textbooks. And I want, I mean, I, I think I know how you feel about that, but can you express your concerns about that? Yeah, I mean, so I think, you know, part of what it's gonna, it's gonna take in order to kind of make these changes and, and bring about a different approach to governance, uh, and to overcome the the racism that uh, is inherent within U.S. society and U.S. Uh, every single U.S. institution, we we really need. I mean, history is important here, and especially confronting and reckoning with the history of racial exploitation and oppression is key. And so, in this moment when you know there's a growing awareness, and and also more, you know critical histories like the 1619 Project and others who are exposing these new histories, there's a, there's a backlash um, against it from people who don't, who, who don't want to uh, confront the truth, who want to tell a narrative, a, a particular narrative about the United States and who, 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 who recognize, especially given the reality of the demographics of the nation, that, that um, that that white supremacy is not uh, white supremacy is, is on its way out. There's a you know the, the that and 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 are desperate to hold on to a white to, to white supremacist institutions and a white supremacist narrative. And the way that you do that is by censoring um, the truth, is by obscuring uh, you know the ways in which race racism has been central to American political and economic development. Um, and so, you know, we're at this real crossroads where we 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 need this history more than ever, and yet there's this growing backlash against um, against exposing students to this history. And so, you know, it's a um, this is a critical battle, uh, you know, that that's before us. And um, and yet, you know, I continue to remain optim, you know, because I have to, optimistic and and confident that those on the right side of history will ultimately prevail. Uh, okay, my last question uh, has nothing to do with your book, but uh, it's just something that knocks in my head. I come from Colombia and there is certain racism there. It's not palpable, it's not visible, but it's there. I live now in Canada and yes, there is some racism here as well. However, in the States, it's just so dense and palpable and, and it's just hard to not to see. I wonder what makes the United States, I mean, it's the same white and blacks and in my country or here in Canada as in the States, but in the States it's just so much more intense. I, I wonder if you have an opinion on why. Yeah, so here's again why history is, is, is really important. I mean, of course there were, um, enslaved people of color in Latin America and Colombia, but I mean, the, the answer is, is slavery. The answer is the slave system in the United States and then the continued uh, con and, and conscientious denial of people of African descent um, and indigenous people 
of uh, of of rights and access to citizenship and uh, and a society that based completely on genocide and and um, and racial subjugation. And of course, I mean, you know, these are issues that uh, pervaded throughout the Western Hemisphere, but um, the United States and, and especially the slave system in, in the United States um, was was particularly severe and the the kind of the you know from the one drop rule on just the 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 racial codes and the nature of segregation and domination um, as it developed during and, and of course after slavery I think helps us understand uh, why racism is experienced as it is today and also why the you know police and um and prison systems and again this is something that this is an enduring feature that we see um in the caribbean as well um you know have become post-emancipation just uh crucial to maintaining racial hierarchies and um and the social order so the short answer is is uh is slavery hmm. Well, there's a lot of material in, in your book, a lot of history that we may or may not want to see because it's real. <laughs> I wonder if you could tell us one more time the name of your book and where can people follow you? The, the book is America on Fire, the Untold History of Police Violence and Black Rebellion Since the 1960s. And I am on Twitter at E-L-I-Z-A-B-H-I-N-T-O-N, Eliza B. Hinton. Uh, Professor Hinton, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for this great conversation.